Good morning. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. I am Jim Miller, the senior pastor. It's my honor to lead you in this time of worship, along with the assistance of Larry Henning with our sound and sight. We are so glad that you were able to join our virtual worship service. If you have to step out for any reason, the service can be seen later on YouTube. It's hard to believe it's the first Sunday of March already, which means we are celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion. I invite you to please have some unleavened bread, grape juice handy for later in our service when we celebrate this holy sacrament. All are invited in our tradition to receive. I hope you can be part of this needed meal as God feeds us to carry out God's work. Welcome to all who are joining us. Perhaps this is your first Sunday here, or it's hard to believe it's soon going to be a year that we've been doing this Zoom-wise, and I think of the progression we've made, and I know there are hiccups along the way, and maybe if you're having issues today, you can always try logging out and logging back in, and, and you'll be able to catch up. And I thank you for your patience as we continue to find our way, as God continues to use the life of the church, as we say, the church building's closed, but the ministries are ongoing. Thank you for your faithfulness. I invite, if you haven't already, that you subscribe to our Grace Notes, which is a weekly publication, email. If you do not have computer joining us by phone, you can have hard copy sent to you. It lists, it's sort of our Sunday Morning Bulletin Plus newsletter that tells you all that's happening in the life of the church. Also, our webpage at graceumc.org is an excellent way to stay informed about how God is at work in our community. And so here we are. We gather on this third Sunday in Lent to be fed, to allow God to fuel us that we may serve all the more. Now let us take time to center ourselves as we hear this morning's prelude, Lift High the Cross. <laughs> Please join me now in our call to worship. Who is this who enters the doors of our temple, who overturns the tables, strews silver and gold on the floor, frees the sacrificial doves from gilded cages? Listen as they rise. The beating of their wings is a song of loud hosanna. It is Jesus of Galilee 
the Son of God, who comes to cleanse the great temple, to restore its subverted chambers to a house of hallowed prayer. Then let us open the doors of our hearts even wider, so he can cast out the thieves who would take what is sacred and tender and turn it hard as gold in a fist. May the temple within us be a refuge where doves of peace roost in the rafters. May it be a garden that bears the fruits of a generous spirit. O oh Lord, take what is corrupt and withered and let it break forth in beauty. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Truth be told, Jesus, there are lots of tables that need overturning in our lives. Beneath the veneer of respectability, the tidy rows and neat regulations hide dark addictions and angry judgments, hungry greeds and heartless rejections. We know the pain, and so do those around us of keeping up the facade. What a relief it would be to have it all upset, smashed, scattered, destroyed. So perhaps, Jesus, today you can pay us a visit and help us to radically rearrange the furniture of our lives. Amen. Our opening hymn is found on page 559, Christ has made the sure foundation, offered by Jen Moss and Betsy Moore.
And now let us affirm our faith together as we offer the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascendeth into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. special word of welcome to our children. So glad that you are part of our worship experience each Sunday morning and hope you're able to be part of our children's Sunday school that happens at 1130. In just a couple of weeks, the Saturday night before Palm Sunday, March 27th, Kids Club is planning another very special gathering. Miss Terry's hard at work already. Well, here on this third Sunday in Lent, I wanted to talk with you about today's gospel reading. For in this reading, we're told that Jesus cleanses the temple. I keep this picture. I know it's hard to see uh, uh, on screen here, but it's actually a picture of Jesus in the temple. And there are several stories where he gathered to do what we're doing, to worship and to teach. So here he is in the temple. But this time, something very different happens. We're told he cleanses the temple to clean, to cleanse. Do you help with cleaning around your house? Well, I thought I heard some moans and groans there for a moment, but uh, I hope you do. I hope you help your, your mom and dad uh, uh, clean up from time to time. There's an old saying, there's nothing like company coming that causes us to, to clean. Well, that's what was happening here in Jerusalem where the temple was located. You see, it was Passover time. It was a, a time of celebration, how God liberated the Israelites from Egypt, provided a way through the Red Sea into the Promised Land, a remarkable story that they're celebrating. And so you would think to celebrate, there would be a lot of cleaning up, getting ready for the thousands who would be joining them. But what does Jesus do? He makes a mess. Do you ever get accused of making a mess? He makes a mess. He overturns the tables of the money changers and, and the animals all go fleeing. Why would Jesus do such a thing? Why this cleansing? Jesus is teaching in a very vivid and powerful way that the practice of temple will no longer be needed. You won't need sacrificial animals or money changers because Jesus is our temple. That is, Jesus comes to us to be at the very center of our lives. Now we may clean up for company. Growing up, we always had a couple of times, in particular, it was such a thing as spring cleaning and fall cleaning that my mother would lead us in. That was more than the typical doing the dishes, dusting or vacuuming, but a spring cleaning, oh, that, that meant uh, taking out the storm windows and putting in the screens and letting the fresh air of springtime enter into the home, changing the shelf paper, cleaning the closets, and all that would, we would do with our rooms and all the rooms of the house. A deep cleaning, if you will. Well, the word Lent means spring. 
And I think of this Lenten season as a time that we do some spiritual cleaning, as if Jesus is coming into our hearts, into our very lives, and saying, you know what, that needs to go. That, that, that's not needed. That, that's not something uh, you should be doing. We don't need to be making ugly posts or inappropriate TikToks or anything like that, but rather, let me show you what we can be doing together to share the love of God that kind of spring cleaning spiritually is what we experience each time we worship. Jesus fills us in new ways. It was just the other day. Remember how hard it rained the other day? I let my dogs outside in, into our lawn and uh, I called them back in. My one dog, Storm, she came without hesitation. Callie, she just sort of stood there and looked at me. She didn't even seem to mind that she was getting drenched. I was calling her and she wasn't responding. She was being disobedient. And then the neighbors let their dog out. There's a fence between them. They can't get to each other, but my dog seen that other dog, why, just took off running up and down the fence line where it was nothing but mud and with the rain coming down formed a little river. And soon my two dogs were covered with mud. I was not happy. If there had been some tables, I think I would have been like Jesus, t tipping them over at that point. I was furious. They're the mess of having now to bathe dogs, which is worse than having a clean house. Then I thought, I, I need to get outside. I need to get some air. I can't sit down now. So I thought, I'll go to the local farmer just a couple miles away and buy some straw and spread it so we won't have this muddy mess. While I did that, I brought the straw back, and there was my daughter putting on her coat, and I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm gonna help you. And what a task I was dreading having to do by myself, it became a father-daughter moment as she helped me spread that straw to dry up some of that mud and liquid and provide bedding. That's what God does with us. Lent is a time, yes, to clean up the mess in our lives, but it's also a journey that Jesus wants to make with us, to walk each day with us. And just yesterday with the sun shining, I happened to notice my dog, Callie, laying in the straw, just taking in the sunshine, providing a better path. God will provide your life and mine and our life together a better path. Let us allow this day to be a day of cleansing and a day of renewal as we serve and love Jesus all the more. Thank you for being part of our service. Amen. And now I'd like to invite us to hear this account from John's Gospel of Jesus cleansing the temple. Hear these words. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple's been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? but he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And now I invite you to hear this passage as we bring in the second commandment this week from Exodus 20. You shall not make for yourself an idol whether in the form of anything that is heavy, heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. 
you shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. So again, this week's commandment is the second one. Do not make an idol for yourself. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the beauty of this day. Thank you for this very special season of Lent. And as we gather at this time and seek to be prepared to receive this sacrament, we ask for a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit upon us. Use this time to your honor and glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So did you have any idols growing up? Who were your idols? That is, who were the movie stars or sports figures or musicians or political leaders that, that you really looked up to? We had a fascinating conversation about this last Sunday afternoon in our youth group, and our youth are doing this same study based on the Ten Commandments to all of our youth. I hope you'll be part of our gatherings on Sunday afternoons at 4 o'clock. And through this conversation, we talked about our, our heroes, our, our idols in that sense of the word, and where we thought we needed to be careful is when idols can become idol worship. Now, we saw last week in the first commandment, now in the Jewish tradition, the first and second commandment are combined, but we, we break them apart. Last week, do not have any other gods before you, God being number one. But this week talks about do not make any idols to yourself. That is, do not just have or say that one person or anything can actually contain God. For God is greater than anyone or anything. Remember when Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments on that holy mountain, the people that Moses was leading were becoming very anxious. Oh, he was up there 40 days wondering what's going on. Maybe he's not coming back. And so they said to Aaron, make us an idol. And so they took their gold rings and all that they had and formed it into this golden calf that they could worship. You see, they wanted to have something they could see to worship. And God's fury and anger over this. There is no one thing that we should ever see as being God. For God is everywhere. God is above us. God is beyond any statue. Or even the Ark of the Covenant didn't have a throne on it because God was greater. Well, sometimes we, we take this scripture and we think, well, that was way back then. I don't have uh, idols or statues that I, I say are God. But isn't it amazing how Jesus can take a passage and hit us right between the eyes and talk about right where we are at. Adam Hamilton put it this way in his book, Words of Life, when he said the following. He writes, I've known people who came to worship their church buildings more than the God for whose worship they were built. We can do it with the Bible. Some Christians I know idolize their pastor or youth ministers or choir directors or Sunday school teachers or favorite Christian writers. Often these persons have played such an important role in our lives. From them we have felt God's love and through them we have heard God speak. If we're not careful, we can come to love God's human instruments more than the God who speaks through them. Hamilton continues, I've, I've seen this happen with people who don't read the Bible, only their favorite Christian author. Missions, music, social justice, the fight for inclusion, environmental ministries, teaching children, and a hundred other good things that we might do for God can easily take the place of God in our lives. I've known Christians who make politics and politicians an idol. This is what Jesus was rebelling against. Here we find him in the temple, and, and it's Passover time. Imagine a city that's hosting the Super Bowl 
what it's like the week leading up to the event, or, or Daytona, or Indianapolis before the big race, or, or a major city before a political convention. Here they were, everything was set up, everything was the way it needed to be. Those who were exchanging the money, you couldn't have Roman emperor's faces on coins dedicated to the temple, or the animals that were brought. It's not very easy to travel with animals after all. Everybody was there and lined up. But what does Jesus do? But he comes in and drives them all away, the animals, and tips over the tables, and the money flies everywhere. Why? Here is Jesus as the prophet. Here is Jesus saying, this isn't needed anymore. Because Jesus is our temple. He is the one who brings us the image of God. He is the one who makes God known to us. We cannot contain God to any one part of our lives, to any one thing, but rather to know Christ and to worship him is what we are called to do. The disciples, when they see this, they recall a verse that actually comes from Psalm 69, zeal for his house will consume him. The psalmist wrote those words because the psalmist was being singled out, was being persecuted because of his faith in God. Perhaps you have known what it's like to be put down, to be treated badly because of your faith. Even sometimes family members don't understand why you're taking this time for devotion or giving of yourselves, tithing to the church. Perhaps others have made fun of you for being part of a youth group or being part of a Christian gathering. Here is Jesus, who will pay the ultimate price on the cross. Zeal for his house will consume him. In Christ, all is overcome. He is your source of strength. Are you relying upon him when we do not allow ourselves to focus on the idols, when we instead focus upon Christ, all is overcome. You are given the strength to endure. And when that's all cleansed away, we can be open for a fresh revelation from God. This is what Jesus was providing. This is what the disciples were recalling in that moment. In Celtic spirituality, it has included the identification of what are sometimes called thin places. That is, those places often, but not always mountaintops or other beautiful natural settings, where it feels like the distance between our finite and material world And God's eternal and spiritual reality collapses and becomes thin. I've appreciated that that phrase and have applied it from time to time to favorite locations in my life or places where significant insight or development occurred. But when I read John's testimony, it occurs to me that every place has the capacity to be a thin place because God's presence in Jesus is set loose in the world, no longer confined to temple, or for that matter, to church or even sacrament, but always available to the followers of Jesus, those whom, to borrow Paul's words, are the body of Christ. Here, this can be our thin place when we allow Jesus to be at the center of our life, the one we truly idolize. It's been a couple of years ago. One morning, our custodian, Nelson, that's his title. If you know Nelson, you know he does so much for the life of this church. Talk about someone who goes the extra miles. He's here to greet Larry, Debbie, and I on a Sunday morning. The room is heated and everything is okay. Well, one particular day, he he called me to uh, the very front of the church here, the front steps. And here was a box with all sorts. It looked like idols. It wasn't Buddha, but, uh, but looked like that. And in it was a note addressed to the pastor saying, I need your help. I am turning from this religion. I am giving my life to Christ. Take these idols from me so I am not tempted again to turn that way, but that I might focus on Jesus. Well, we took them away. 
And I think about that powerful role. Jesus is not only the prophet who the professes, this isn't needed anymore, but the priest who brings us cleansing and allows us fresh opportunity to follow him anew. That's what this person was experiencing. And if you are, are watching this day, know I have been praying for you. And I love that you thought of the church as that body of Christ that will, in fact, walk alongside you. Whether you are someone battling addiction and, and you feel like you're, you're, you're going to retreat, you're going to revert, no, you have the body of Christ as your source of strength, praying for you, walking with you as we seek to follow God. This was the invitation that Jesus gives us, Jesus being the image of God that we can worship this day. God who wants a right relationship with us. Ours to know. Jesus said, when they asked him for a sign, he said, destroy this temple, I'll rebuild it in three days. They said, we've been building this temple for 46 years. You're going to do it in three days? Of course, he was talking about his body, his own death and resurrection, where all in Christ Jesus is overcome. Now, I sure miss gathering with you in this sacred space. And we are facing the reality we're not going to be back in this space for Easter. It's going to be sometime after Easter. But even though that, that disappoints us, even though we find that difficult, we do know that our walk with Christ is not put on hold because we cannot physically be together. In fact, this can be that very time in our lives of reformation, of change, and of renewal. This can be the time that we in our ministries, like our United Methodist men that are going to be regathering this coming Saturday at 9, can be a time where we can know fellowship, where we can reach out in ministry, in fact, where we can go deeper, where we can have the difficult but needed conversations about race and identify our next steps, where we can talk about what it means to be an inclusive community. We know the storm clouds of General Conference now not going to be till late August of 2022 but we know there is the potential of a church split. But here, at, in fact, there's a new denomination. They've even gotten a name for one that occurs, but that's not grace, and I pray never will be, because I believe that God is calling us to continue and going deeper in our faith, and yes, we can agree to disagree in love over issues. Our work, we must continue to move forward. That's what Jesus was demonstrating in this time. That's the opportunity that Jesus is giving us to reflect his presence here and now. After all, we too, as Hamilton writes, are created in the image of God. And we as the church are called to reflect that image now more than ever. Hamilton tells a powerful story of a woman in his church who works as a grocery store clerk. One particular day, a woman was coming through the line and she had her EBT card, her government assistance card, and she was purchasing her groceries for the month. They were adding up their $230 total, and when they looked at the card, why, it only had $188. She began to cry and put some of the items back in her car to go back to the shelf. When the woman behind her took out her credit card and said, here, let me buy your groceries. The clerk said, by that moment, all three of them were crying. We don't know if, if that woman who bought the groceries was, was Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, atheist, but in that moment, the image of God's love was being reflected. God can use any time. God can use this time in your life to draw us closer to the heart of God and allow Christ to use us in powerful new ways. Dr. Janet Hunt puts it this way. She writes, I, for one, am resting my deepest, truest hope here, in this unusual time, 
when such destruction still threatens so much of what we hold dear and where death seems somehow more present than ever before, I'm resting my deepest, truest hope on this, that Jesus is here in the middle of it all, already making true the promise of the resurrection, showing God's power in unexpected places and often hard to fathom ways. These days I have been so blessed to witness just that, through the sacrificial love of those who have been called to follow him. So here I'd like to give you these challenge questions for this week, halfway through the season of Lent. How do you hear the meaning of Jesus driving out the money changers from the temple today? Are you hearing it as I do now, as Jesus clearing the way for God to do a whole new thing? Where have you witnessed the wisdom, the power of God at work of late? Lastly, how do these passages speak in this particular time when many are weary and where death still threatens to have the last word? How do we embody resurrection hope here in the middle of Lent? Amen. Please join me now in our prayer of confession. Jesus, cleanser of temples and souls. At this midpoint in the Lenten journey, look deep within our hearts and our lives and clear away all that holds us back. May our minds, spirits, and bodies be a temple that is open to your presence. And may our words and our actions be transparent to your love and truth. We pray that this church community will be purified in its life and mission so that all that we do in and from here may reveal your gospel to others. In a moment of silence, we sit before you and name those things for which we seek your cleansing and healing, so that we may be more faithful disciples. Hear these words of assurance. Friends of Jesus, we are made clean by the words he has spoken to us. There is room in our lives and in our community for the Holy One to dwell. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now we'll have a special music sanctuary offered by our chancel choir.
Thank you, choir, so much to be that sanctuary, that place, but even more important, that community where God's love is known and where all can be overcome. This morning, we take this time to give thanks and ask God's blessings upon our offering. Because of your giving, the ministries that touch lives, that let people know that God is present, are communicated. Lives are being touched. Lives are being turned around. Lives are turning from other ways to following and knowing Jesus Christ. And you are part of this journey. Thanks be to God for your faithfulness. Amen. I invite you now to join me in our great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, you bore up the ark on the waters, saved Noah and his family, and made covenant with every living creature on earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and on your holy mountain he heard your still, small voice. So with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your Spirit led him into the wilderness, where he fasted forty days and forty nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles during forty days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now, when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, 
gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. As children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, I invite you to partake. And now Pastor Helen will lead us in our morning prayer. Let us pray. Lord, you teach us truth and we praise you. May we use this freedom to turn towards you. Lord, you remove the stumbling blocks that hold us back and we praise you. May we use this freedom to walk in your way. Lord, you reach down into our hearts and lift us up to your own, and we praise you. May we use this freedom to reach out to others with your love. Creator, we pray for the healing and wholeness of all that you have made, including each and every human heart. For those who grieve, hear our prayer. For all who struggle or are weary, hear our prayer for each person who is hungry thirsty alone or in harm's way hear our prayer for all who face decisions about taking new steps in faith hear our prayer move us closer to others and closer to you sustainer we give you thanks for the healers and helpers teachers and learners, friends and neighbors, family and strangers, and ask your blessing upon us all. Guide us through the questions, doubts, pain and uncertainty of this season. Empty us, fill us, make us into your new creations. 
receive the silent prayers that we now offer from the quiet spaces of our hearts. We lift all of these prayers in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now our closing hymn can be found on page 402, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian, offered by Rodney Ripley and Betsy Moore. Thank you so much. So as I was looking at this picture, it's been in my office for some time that I was going to use to share with the children today. I took a closer look. In fact, it's even hidden by the frame where you see Jesus' hand. There's actually some little birds there. And to me, it looks like he's actually feeding the birds. Here in the temple, being a place of feeding. To me, Lent is that season to look more closely and to see and discover what we didn't see before. And the temple, a place where we gather to worship is just that, to be fed, that we may serve God and discover new ways to grow in our relationship with God and one another. So again, your third question, I invite you to carry 
and to live out this week. How do we embody resurrection hope here in the middle of Lent? Hear these words of sending forth. Go now with God's foolishness and weakness as your only wisdom and strength. Proclaim Christ crucified and seek riches only in the love of God's word and in zeal for God's house. May God's just demands be your nourishment and delight. May Christ be the power and wisdom of God to you, and may the Holy Spirit keep you, thought and word, in God's good grace. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.